الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد. So today we're here to talk about a very important topic, Islam and the problem of racism. And it's one of the mysteries to me, it's amazing to think that we're in 2015, at the end of the year, and we're still dealing with this problem of racism, especially in the country that we live in. We still have this racism and race relations are still on the front news. We still have a culture of police brutality where every couple of months we hear of another shooting, we hear of another incident, we have a, an election coming up and all these politicians, a lot of the issues have to do with race. And you still see racism exhibited uh, in the mouth, from the mouths of politicians and in the policies around the world. And almost no country is immune from that. I want to start by looking at a quote from 51 years ago. Malcolm X, Malik Shabazz, rahimahullah ta'ala, was one of the pioneers, one of the voices of da'wah, a man who brought thousands of people to Islam and continues to do so after his death. They recently discovered a letter of his in the Bronx in some archives, and it was on sale for, I think, a quarter of a million dollars, or $1.25 million. This is an original copy or a picture of the original letter in the handwriting of Malcolm X. And this is, this is a new letter. It's very similar to the stuff that's in the autobiography. But I wanted to read a passage from the original letter itself. And it's amazing when you think about the world we live in today and this voice from 51 years ago. So here he says, if white Americans, and this is his original handwriting. When you read the original letter, it's very different from reading a quote. If white Americans could accept the religion of Islam, if they could accept the oneness of God, then they, they too could sincerely accept the oneness of man and choose to measure others always in terms of their differences and cease to measure others always in terms of their differences in color. And with racism now plaguing America like an incurable cancer, all thinking Americans should be more receptive to Islam as an already proven solution to the race problem. SubhanAllah. Look at this, this amazing quote from 51 years ago. And this, is, this quote is one that's from the autobiography. And this is the one people always hear. It's more popular. America needs to understand Islam. Because this is the one religion that erases from a society the race problem. So in this presentation, I want to pick up where this quote leaves off. Islam, one of the strong points of Islam, and everyone recognizes that, is that this is the one religion that really solved the problem of race. And when you imagine how the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa did that 1400 years ago, in a society that was racist, in a society that was tribalistic, and how effective were his solutions, this doesn't mean that we don't have problems. It doesn't mean that Muslims will not forget their teachings. And you know, devolve into forms of racism. But the way the Prophet offered solutions is something that the world needs today, especially here in America. So in this workshop, it was intended to be a workshop, but in the interest of time, uh, we'll go through as many of the teachings as we can. We want to look at how Islam did and continues to offer solutions to the race problem. So we want to look at, my style is going to be this, we're going to look at some common teachings, some common verses and common hadith of the Prophet wasallam that people quote when it comes to the topic of racism. But we want to look at a deeper background of each of these narrations to see how in history uh, they affected the Muslims at the time of the Prophet wasallam. Text number one, we have about seven texts. I think we'll only be able to do about three or four. Inshallah, we'll try to finish at least four. Those are very important. This is a quote that everyone likes to share. All of you are the children of Adam, and Adam was created from dust. It's from a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. But many of us aren't aware of the entire hadith and what the Prophet really meant and some of the background. So. This has to do with a, a hadith that I call the dung beetle text. It's a hadith where 
the prophet talks about a specific species of animals. It's very interesting. And this is the full text of the hadith. And it's a hadith of Abu Huraira. And it happens to be, if you look at the Jami' of Tirmidhi, the Sunan of Imam Tirmidhi is the last hadith. Very easy to find. Go to the last hadith of this collection. So, you know, there's something to be said about being the first and being the last. I have a session tomorrow on the last moments and the last messages from the Prophet. What, how you choose to end a book, how you choose to end a lecture, how you choose to attend, att uh, end a, a, a series on da'wah or a lifetime of teaching is very important. So when you look at the last hadith of every book, they're also very important. They derive home lessons. So Imam At-Tirmidhi chooses to end his book with this hadith which touches on racism. So let's look at the hadith in a little bit of detail. So the first portion of the hadith, the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, لَا يَنْتَهِيَنَّ أَقْوَامٌ يَفْتَخِرُونَ بِآبَائِهِمُ الَّذِينَ مَاتُوا إِنَّمَا هُمْ فَحْمُ جَهَنَّمٌ he said, let people stop boasting about their forefathers who passed away, for they are now fuel of hellfire. And then he gives a warning. If they don't stop bragging about their forefathers who passed away. And now the Prophet is speaking about the racist elements of Quraysh. There were people from these tribes that were very proud of who they were being from this tribe or that tribe. And they all worship idols. So the Prophet was giving them a lesson. Look, stop doing all this. This is silliness. Stop it now. Because all these people you're proud about, the races, the ancestors, they're in hellfire because they worshiped idols. And that link with you, that race, that tribal belonging is not going to help them in the least. And then he said, otherwise, if you don't stop, you will be more degraded in the sight of Allah than a dung beetle that rolls dung with its nose. Now this is a picture of a dung beetle. It's a specific species of animal. And it's, you can see that it generally plays and it eats and feeds on the excrement of other animals. Now I want you to think for a moment. It's a powerful statement. You can tell from the words of the Prophet, his style in addressing different topics. When it came to racism and human beings feeling they're better than others on the basis of their color or race or tribal affiliation, the Prophet had a unique style. He hated it. It's something that irritated him. And when you look at all these teachings, you'll see that theme. It's something that's very, uh, the Prophet considered despicable. So he addressed it in a different way than he addressed other teachings. So now we want to ask the question, why the dung beetle? The Prophet could have said they're worse than animals. They're worse than this, they're worse than that, they're worse than dogs. Or There's a reason why the Prophet chose his analogies. And I want you to try to appreciate the ijaz in the words of the Prophet Nothing's random here. Everything is chosen for a purpose. Nothing that came out of his mouth وسلم, was random, but it was inspired. It was inspired from above. So, I want to look at some lessons from this hadith, okay? So the Prophet was reminding us basically, number one, racists, he considered them to be below human beings. He compared them to animals. And not just animals, worse than animals. He didn't say they're like animals. He said Allah will consider them more degraded because even to say they were like animals, what's wrong with the animals? What was the fault of the animals? But he said it's worse than this species of animal. And among the animals, he picked the insects. You know, just think from your mind, you know, there's different types of animals. The horse is majestic, the lion is the king of the jungle. But the prophet picked the most despicable or the one that's considered the most despicable. An insect is something running around in the ground. When you see an insect, you want to crush it. It's something that doesn't make life beautiful. Something that irritates you. It makes, it's harmful often for, um, for your life. And he's picked among the animals the dung beetle. And now we want to look at why this particular species. There was an interesting study done in 2011 by a group of scientists in the UK. And they spent two summers looking at 
about 9,000 different dung beetles from 17 different species. So it's actually a group of species that belong to this category. And the scientific name is the scarab beetle. And what's unique about this animal, this is the only animal in the animal kingdom that feeds its source of nourishment is the excrement or the excrement of other animals. That's very interesting. Feces of other animals are the nourishment for the, for the scarab beetle. Now this group of scientists, they looked at a bunch of species and they wanted to see what kind of excrement these, these beetles were more attracted to. So they made these buckets in the forest of different excrement from different species. And they found the results were interesting. They were attracted the most to human feces. And then number two, chimpanzee feces. Number three, the feces of dead rats, or the carcasses rather of dead rats. Number four, pig droppings. Number five, the feces of carnivores. And the least on the list were the feces of herbivores, like the cattle and the livestock. So you can see their conclusion was, it was very interesting when they published the conclusion, they said, well, our conclusion is the smellier the feces, the more attracted the dung beetle are to the, 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 the feces. So look at the depths of the analogy here. It's not just an animal that feeds on the waste of other animals, but the, the worst or the, 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 you know, there's a gradation of filth, right? Even Islamically, cattle and livestock, their, their feces aren't considered najas. But there are degrees of nudges and impurity. But the more impure the substance, the more attracted the dung beetle was to that as a source of nourishment. So look at the lessons of the Prophet ﷺ. Can you think of a more, you know, if you had to come up with a phrase to describe racist or an analogy, can you think of a more befitting analogy? This is something despicable, something that stinks. So the Prophet ﷺ, his message was that racism is something that's filthy. It's something that has a smell. It's something that stinks. It's not worthy of human beings. And then he said in part two of this hadith, the same hadith, he says, He said, Verily, Allah removed from you the blemish of jahiliya, the period before Islam, and this boasting about your ancestors. So now Allah, or the Prophet's, Speaking to the Muslims, tell them, look, Islam came, alhamdulillah, removed this blemish, this really stain from your, from your society, from your character, and this boasting of your ancestors. God has removed the pride of ignorance from you, along with this boasting about lineage. So racism belongs to the past. That was the message of the Prophet. It has no role in Islam. It's something that's, and this is a great blessing, what part of the mercy of the Prophet to human beings. And then the Prophet continued, Innama, he said there are two types of people. Innama huwa mu'minun taqiyun wa fajirun shaqiyun. He said there are two types of people. Not Arab, non Arab, not black and white, not this group or that group, not even Muslim, non Muslim. He said a pious believer and a wretched sinner. And he said, Annasu kulluhum banu Adam wa Adamu khuliqa min turab. And human beings are all the children of Adam, and Adam was created from dust. So this is the end of that hadith. So this is how you understand the words of the Prophet ﷺ. He could have came and just told us, you're all brothers and sisters, but look how he taught the lesson and how deep it is. And we can understand things about this lesson today that we didn't understand back then. Maybe the companions or maybe the early Muslim didn't understand what the, the scarab beetle was or the dung beetle. It's just an insect to them. But now when you look at the depths of the analogy, you realize this was a man who was inspired from above. So the lessons, to just to summarize from this particular hadith, there are only two types of people, and the only thing that matters is faith and deeds. So either you are taqiyun fajir, you believe in Allah, you're fearful of Allah, or taqiyun mu'minun taqiyun, you believe in Allah and you it guides your actions. Or your fajirun shaqiyun, an unlucky person who sins against Allah. So it's about faith and it's about deeds. And we have the same origin, all human beings, and that origin comes from dust. Now another thing he's trying to teach us, um, Adam is our forefather, and Adam was created out of dust. Why was that mentioned? Because to remind us, if you're proud of whatever you are, just remember that you're the same as the person next to you. And secondly, all of you came from the ground. 
Nobody likes dust. If you have, a, you know, you're wearing nice clothes and you're proud and you're, you're, you're coming from a certain, you know, you come from an, uh, an element of respect, some dust gets on you, you want to wipe it off. It's something that you don't like. It's something that degrades you. And the Prophet is reminding all, that we're all the same and at the end of the day we came from the, the dirt, the dust that's in the ground. So this is a great analogy, a great lesson in racism from the Prophet wasallam. Now here is another version of that hadith. This is from uh, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anh. So the Prophet taught the same lesson on another occasion from a slightly different angle. He said, لا تفخروا بآبائكم الذين ماتوا في الجاهلية فوالذي نفسي بيده لما يدحرج الجعل بأنفه خير من آبائكم الذين ماتوا في الجاهلية He said, don't boast about your forefathers who died in Jahiliya for I swear by the one in whose hand is my soul what the dung beetle digs up with its nose is better than your forefathers who died in arrogance. So now he's talking about the feces. So from here, you look at how the Prophet, you know, uh, made this simile. He basically said the racists are like the dung beetle, or worse than the dung beetle. They're not like, but they're worse than the dung beetle. The race or the, the, the tribal affiliation that you're proud of is the dung itself. And then this act of racism, this process of considering yourself better than others is similar to digging your nose in the dung. So this is how the Prophet considered racist. And this is how he ended from one of his lessons, the problem of racism from his society. Again, racism has a smell, is filthy, is despicable, is unworthy of humanity, and, okay, you guys need to fix that. And it's something that is sub-animalistic, not even animalistic. So this is hadith number one. Hadith number two, or the second narration, this is a more practical narration. This is something that actually happened um, with an incident and a story behind it. So this is a, a text that many people perhaps have read and they perhaps share. Leave the calls of Asabi or nationalism for they stink. So when was this said? This happened during a battle called Banil Mustalib in the sixth year of the Hijrah. So something happened, the Muslims were coming back from the battle and in the sixth year of the Hijrah, so this was the Muslim armies, they were coming back with the companions. And the companions, they were human beings. And they had their faults, but at the end, Allah was pleased with all of them. They were guided by the Prophet, uh, and they were guided, and they were given, they were role models. But when something happened, one of the companions shoved another, and this led to some infighting in the Muslim camp, the Muslims are coming back to Medina. They're not in Medina yet. So one of the companions involved in the scuffle, he was from the Ansar, and the other one was from the Muhajiri. So they were from different tribes. So when this shoving match happened, the person who was from the Ansar, he called out, Ya al Ansar. Oh Ansar, come to my defense. And the one who was from the Muhajir, Muhajirin, he said, Ya al Muhajirin. And then some of them came to their defense. And then you had these two groups of Muslims that were really tense and things got heated. And someone informed the Prophet, the Prophet was not there, but he was informed of what happened. And he became angry. He came rushing to the scene. He came rushing to the scene and he was so upset. They said he, they could see how upset he was. And he said to them, Allah ma baalu da'u ahl al and he kept repeating that. He said, I'm still alive and you're talking like you used to talk in Jahiliya? What are these calls of Jahiliya? What are these calls of Jahiliya? So it made him so upset. And the, and the companions, they were really, when they saw him in that state, they were repentant, they stopped immediately and they were shocked. And then the Prophet wasallam, he said to them, Da'uha fa'innaha muntina. He said, leave all of this because it stinks, it has a smell. So again, the same teaching, when you, have, when you consider one race against another, one tribe against another, it's the same thing. So the Prophet said, leave all of that. It has no place in an Islamic society and it stinks. It's something not worthy of you. So this is how the Prophet dealt with a real life instant, uh, instance in, among the companions that was bordering on tribalism or racism. Now, people weren't happy. 
you know, there was a backlash. And this is something people don't realize. There was a backlash when this happened. People think that, you know, sometimes we have this misconception, the Prophet came and he just recited verses, the problems melted away, there was no, you know, there were no issues. But it was a struggle from the first day of his ministry to the last day of his life. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa he was patient, he was struggling with his people, there were people that were unhappy, there were some that left the Muslim community, there were some that continued fighting against them. And even among their camp, there were people of different levels. So there was a backlash when this happened. Um, the hypocrites in this time exposed their true colors. This is the time when the Prophet squashed all of this. Now you can imagine the Ansar. What are they thinking? The Ansar think, look, we gave these Muslims shelter. They're immigrants. We're the indigenous population. We gave them shelter. You know, they came here and now they want to be equal to us. They want to be above us. They were very upset, some of them. And the hypocrites among them, they started saying things. This is the occasion where Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, the chief of the hypocrites, he said something very famous, infamous, which Allah quotes. He said to his, com you know, his companions, Wallahi, la irraja'na ila al-madina, la yukhrijanna al-a'azzu minha al-adhal. He said, by Allah, when we get back to Medina, again, they're coming back to Medina from a battle. That's the history here. When we get back to Medina, the honorable ones will drive out the lowly ones. And this is in Surah Al-Munafiqeen. Allah exposed what he said. There was another hypocrite, and he said this, some really hurtful words. He said, وَمَا مِثْلُنَا وَمِثْلُهُمْ إِلَّا كَمَا قَالَ الْقَائِلِ سَمْ مِنْ كَلْبَكْ يَأْكُلُكْ He said, what's happening here is like what the saying goes, you feed your dog or you fatten your dog to have it bite you in the end. So they're talking about the muhajirin like dogs. So can you imagine how, you know, some people are incredibly racist. And they weren't happy. Racists are never happy when people come to make human beings equal. When reform comes, it's not easy. And you'll find that in every society. That's why so many people are not so happy now. And you can see in the election season, all these uh, things are surfacing. Um, and Omar radiallahu anh, when Allah revealed the verse, Omar ibn al-Khattab, he took out his sword and he asked the Prophet, let me take care of business. You know, because now Abdullah ibn Ubay was exposed. This is the time he was exposed. Up until this time, he's among the Muslims, the Prophet refused to expose him. But now when he said these comments, Allah revealed the verse, Surah Al-Munafiqeen came down, and now you know, the Muslims knew what was up. So Omar ibn al-Khattab offered to take care of business, the Prophet refused, and he said, I don't want infighting among the Muslims. I don't want people to start fighting each other. I don't want people to say that the Muslims, they fight each other, fight their own people. So he refused for Omar ibn al-Khattab to approach Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Sadu. So even in his case, the Prophet is so lenient, and he was so, uh, he wanted reform, but he wanted it in a gentle way. So the lessons from this incident is that reform is never easy. Even the Prophet had faced obstacles at every step of his mission. So we think it's going to be easy when we give da'wah, when we come and teach people. So if the Prophet had to bear all of this, what about us? So we need a healthy dose of patience. We need to raise our bar, our standards. We need to be gentle with the people. And also from the lessons are, the Muslims are not immune from mistakes, not even the companions. But their claim to fame was that Allah guided them. And the Prophet وسلم, pointed out their mistakes and they were humbled and they always corrected themselves. And also, success doesn't come from perfection, but from the process of continuous reform. That's very, very important. To deal with any problem, even racism, you're not going to solve it overnight. It's going to take a lot of effort, and it's going to be a continuous struggle until, um, for a very, very long time. And at the end of the day, you can see how the Muhajirin and Ansar were you know, involved in this fight. These were labels. Are these good labels or bad labels? These were good labels. Allah praises the Muhajireen and the Ansar in the Quran. But when these labels and identities became a source of division, the Prophet squashed that. So for us, the lesson is our labels, our identity should never ever be the source of division. When you use good labels and you find anyone who's involved with identity is labeled, we're this type of Muslim, you're that type of Muslim, they'll say, you know what, what's wrong with this term? It's a good term, it comes from this, it comes from that. 
What was wrong with the Muhajireen and the Ansar? Nothing. But it's the idea of dividing human beings. And that's the same thing that racism is. It's a division between human beings. So we should never let these things divide us. Always be mindful of the greater community as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam was. So this is your second hadith. Hadith number three, or text number three is this. <clears throat> and this is actually a verse, a verse of the Quran. This is probably the favorite verse quoted by people when it comes to racism. Oh, human beings, we created you from a single male and a single female. And then we made you into nations and tribes so that you may know one another. Now, most of us don't understand where this was revealed and how it solved a problem of racism at that time. This happened during the conquest of Mecca. When the Prophet entered Mecca, his homeland, and without any fighting, Mecca submitted to Islam. So the Prophet ﷺ, what did he do? It was a great event. And this is in Surah Al-Hujurat, verse 13. So Imam Qurtubi in his tafsir gives an amazing context, this, the revelation of this verse. So that context is this. The conquest of Mecca happened the eighth year of the Hijrah, two years before the Prophet passed. Now, the Prophet entered the Kaaba, there was no fighting. And basically the first thing he did, he destroyed the idols in Masjid Al-Haram. So he purified the Masjid from all the idols. Then he made tawaf on his camel seven times. And after the tawaf, it was time to pray. Now it's time to pray. And you have to imagine the importance in the, of this historical scene. The Prophet, after 13 years of oppression and eight years in Medina with the Meccans fighting them, so after almost two decades, more than two decades, he's back in his homeland. He's back where Islam started. He's back where he was born. And now when he entered Mecca, Makkah was like a valley at that time. There were no walls like you have the masjid today. Everyone could see what's going on. So now you had thousands and thousands of Muslims. And you had so many non-Muslims, the citizens of Makkah watching. So many people on the fence, so many people thinking about Islam, and some enemies who still wanted to fight, but they couldn't. Now they have no power left. So the whole world is watching. Now what the Prophet does at this occasion is very significant. So you can imagine the importance of that scene. So the Prophet, when it's time to pray, who's the Mu'addin? His Mu'addin was Bilal radiallahu anh, an African slave. Just look at the irony. Bilal was a slave who was tortured by the Quraysh in Mecca. And he was the one who was spit upon, the, the boulders were on him, they tried to kill him, but he was freed. So the Prophet called Bilal and he said, it's time for Adhan. And how was the Adhan given? The Prophet told Bilal to climb the Kaaba and give the adhan from the top of the Kaaba. And now Bilal starts to climb the Kaaba. And you can imagine, the Kaaba was something very special at that time. It was guarded by a tribe. Not everyone could touch it. Not everyone could go inside. Even today, only a few people can go inside. It's something that is guarded. And it's something considered sacred. And it's something the Quraysh were proud about. Now imagine the Quraysh looking at this former slave that they used to torture now he's climbing and he's standing on top with his feet on top of the Kaaba. And you can imagine those who were hypocrites, those who had you know, diseases in their heart, they would be talking. And they were talking. So the, some of them started saying things. So one of them says this, Alhamdulillah. What did he say Alhamdulillah about? He said, Alhamdulillah alladhi qabada abi hatta la yara hadha al-yawm. He said, Alhamdulillah, my father died long before seeing this despicable day. So he was thankful that his father didn't live long enough to see this day. And another one, he said this. He said, ما وجد محمد غير هذا الغراب الأسود مؤذنا. He said, couldn't Muhammad find someone other than this black crow to give the adhan? Racist comments. So they were racist among their time. And they weren't happy, so they started saying these things. And then Abu Sufyan was there. Abu Sufyan at that time was on the fence. Abu Sufyan was the leader of the Quraysh. Now, Iman has started to enter his heart, but not fully. So he was on the fence. So he said, he was there also, he said, I wanted to say something. I had some feeling I wasn't happy. I wanted to say something, but something held me back. Because I feared maybe the angel would come down and inform the Prophet of what I was saying. So he, you know, you can see he was struggling with faith. So it still hadn't entered fully. So all these people weren't happy when Bilal came and gave the adhan. 
Now Jibreel came and Jibreel informed the Prophet وسلم, what these people were saying. Now the Prophet knew he had to give, he, he made salah and he knew that now the people, there are some people that are racist, they're not happy with what happened. So he gave a beautiful address, a sermon, a khutbah at that time to address the problem of racism. And at that time Allah revealed that verse right before that. So this verse was revealed at that time to address this problem of racism. And then the Prophet gave a khutbah to complement that, that verse. And it was a beautiful khutbah. And this is a khutbah to the masses on the conquest of Mecca. An amazing speech. And if you look at the words of the Prophet, they're so short. His khutbahs were so full of meaning, but yet they're so concise. So he said after praising Allah, Alhamdulillah, he praised Allah, and after that he said, Amma ba'd. And he began his khutbah. He said, there are three components of this khutbah. He said, first thing, أَيُّهَا nas, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ أَذْهَبَ عَنْكُمْ رَبِّيَةَ الْجَاهِلِيَةَ Similar to that previous hadith. He said, O oh people, Allah has removed this blemish of jahiliyyah, this stain of racism from you. And then he said, يَا أَيُّهَا nas, إِنَّمَا النَّاسُ رَجُلًا O oh people, there are only two types of human beings. So he's speaking to the races, speaking to the Muslims, to the non-Muslims, to everyone. He said, oh people, there are only two types of human beings. What are those two types? Barun taqiyun, karimun ala rabbihi, wa fajirun shaqiyun, hayinun ala rabbi. He said, the one who is pious and righteous, and he's noble in the sight of Allah. And he said, the one who is wicked, and he's sinful, and he's wretched in the sight of Allah. That's the only two types of people. It's not about Quraysh and non-Quraysh. It's not about black and white or Arab, non-Arab or this or that. There's only two types of people at the end of the day. Those who fear Allah and those who don't fear Allah. And then he said the third component of his speech was this verse. And he recited the verse that was revealed. Ya ayyuhan nas, inna khalaqunakum min dhakarin wa untha وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلًا لِتَعَارَفُوا إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ Beautiful verse and then he said أَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَاسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ لِي وَلَكُمْ And he ended his speech like that. A beautiful message. First, reminding them, look, this thing is in the past. And secondly, only two types of people. And thirdly, the best speech is the book of Allah. Ending with a verse that teaches some amazing lessons. So this is a beautiful address that addressed racism. This is a translation of that. Um, so this verse, what does this verse teach us quickly? This verse teaches us some things. And this is the most important Quranic verse on the topic of racism. So Allah here is reminding us, oh human beings, we create, there are three points that Allah emphasizes. Number one, we have a common origin. Because we have a common origin, we're all kind of like family. There's an equality basic to human beings. إِنَّا خَلَقُنَاكُمْ مِنْ ذَكَرٍ وَأُنْثَىٰ We created you, all of you, every race that exists, we created you from one man and one woman. And from those two, we created nations and tribes so that you may... So why? What was the purpose? So Allah created a diversity. First, there's a common origin. And secondly, from that common origin, there's a diversity of colors and tribes and races and languages. But what's the purpose of that diversity? لِتَعَرَفُ Lita'arafu means just to identify one another. Just to, you can identify one another and cooperate with one another. So it's kind of like an a, a identification purpose. It's like uh, when you say, you know, you're telling your friend, you know, you're calling your friend, you're meeting him somewhere, meet me outside, I'm standing next to the black car. Or I'm standing next to the red car. That color doesn't mean anything. It's just an identity. It's just to identify. It's something that makes life interesting and diverse. Imagine all of us had to eat the same food every day. Everyone wore the same dress, the same color. Imagine everyone here is dressed in white or dressed in one particular color. It would be boring. Allah created this life to interesting with diversity, with, with you know, different foods and different languages. And he talks about ikhtilafu al-sinatikum wa alwanikum. This diversity as a sign of Allah, the diversity of your languages, the diversity of your colors. Even Bani Israel, they had to eat the same food every day, manna and salwa, and they begged you, uh, Musa alayhi salam, give us onions, give us garlic, give us this, you know, the other food, because we're tired of that. So human beings, they need interest in their life, they need diversity, they need to spice up their life. 
And that's what Allah did with all these human beings and all these races and tribes. But nothing more than that. When it becomes more than that as a basis of superiority or to distinguish between human beings, then there's a problem. And then that's why Allah ends the verse by reminding us the only basis for ranking human beings inna akramakum Allah atqaqum those who have the most taqwa. So it's about morality at the end of the day. So this is the common lessons that we learn that all human beings have the same origin. Along with that common origin, we have this basic diversity for the purpose of identification. And the only basis for ranking human beings and considering one better than the other is morality and character and the fear of Allah Azza wa Jal. So this is, you know, Ibn al-Kathir, he says, Ibn Kathir says something amazing. He says, all human beings in the tafsir of this verse, all human beings are equal in respect to their earthly lineage from Adam and Eve. All human beings are equal in this respect. And they're distinguished by virtue of religious matters, obeying Allah and following His Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So, this is, I'll go through one more hadith and then maybe we can take some questions. Um, here's another hadith that's very important. This is a text where the Prophet said, Inna Allah yarfa'u bihadha al-kitabi aqwaman. Allah raises, elevates some people by virtue of this book. What book? The Quran, the book of Allah. And he lowers some nations by virtue of this book. This is a hadith about the virtue of the Quran. <coughs> Most of us have heard it, but we don't realize the history behind it and how. And this, is, this has to do with the isnad of the hadith. It's a remarkable story how this hadith was narrated. So this is the, the text of the hadith in Arabic. Inna Allah yarfa'u bihadha al-kitabi aqwaman wa yada'u bihi akhareen. The story here is, this hadith was narrated by Abu Amr Wathila, al Wathila, who was the last living companion. And this happened in the reign of Umar ibn al Khattab when he was the Khalifa. So Umar one day was visiting a northern region called Usfan. So he's the Khalifa of the Muslims and he's visiting this northern region. And when he visits this region, he comes across Nafi' ibn Abdul Harith. Nafi' ibn Abdul Harith was his governor in Mecca. Omar lived in Medina, so he had a governor in Mecca. Obviously, he couldn't be everywhere at the same time, so they used governors. So he visited this region far away, and he found Nafi'ah there. So he asked Nafi'ah, Ya Nafi'ah, who did you leave in Mecca? Who's in charge in Mecca? You're traveling just like I am. And Nafi'ah, he told him, I left in charge Ibn Abza, Abdul Rahman Ibn Abza. And Omar ibn Khattab, he was surprised. He said, Wa Ibn Abza, who is Ibn Abza? I never heard of him. And he said to him, he's a former slave of mine. Mawla min mawalina. One of my former slaves. And so one of his former slaves was the acting governor of Mecca in the absence of Nafir. Umar ibn Khattab, he was shocked. And he was shocked. He said, how did you manage to pull that off? Now Umar, why was he shocked? He wasn't shocked because a slave can't be the, the governor. He was just shocked how was he able to do that and the people accepted that. So he asked him, how did you do that? And he said to him, إِنَّهُ قَارِئٌ لِكِتَابِ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ وَإِنَّهُ عَالِمٌ بِالْفَرَائِدِ So he said, look, my former slave, he's the most knowledgeable of us in the book of Allah, and he's the most knowledgeable in the faraid, the commandments of the Prophet. The faraid refers to the shares of inheritance, but the, what he was trying to say, he's the most knowledgeable in Qur'an and the most knowledgeable in fiqh, the understanding of the Qur'an. So the Umar ibn Khattab, he looked at him and he was so proud and he said, he said, Ama qala Umar ibn Khattab, this is part of the hadith. Qala Umar ibn Khattab, Ama inna nabiyyakum sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qad qal, inna Allah yarfa'u bihadha al-kitabi aqwaman wa yada'u bihi akhadin. He said, verily your prophet, I heard your prophet say, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah raises some people by virtue of this book and he lowers some other people by virtue of this book. So Omar, he put his stamp of approval on what uh, Nafir had done by putting this former slave in charge of Makkah. And he related to a hadith that he remembered from the Prophet wasallam, And he used to say even after that, Abdul Rahman ibn Abza, this former slave, Mimman Rafa'allahu bil kitab, bi kitabihi. Abdul Rahman, this former slave, is one of those individuals that Allah raised through the Book of Allah. So this is something amazing. This is something that happened actually in our history. 
about 14 or 1300 years ago. And this is something we should be proud of. When he, and this hadith in Sahih Muslim, by the way. So we should be proud of that. Look at what our society accomplished. We were able to do centuries before the rest of the world is catching up and still struggling to catch up. I wanted to make a comparison. So what is happening here? A former slave is in charge of the holiest city of Islam. The holiest city of Islam, Mecca. And you have a former slave, he's the governor of Mecca in the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab, very early on. So this is amazing. You know, the rest of, where was the rest of the world at that time? And where is the rest of the world today? Just consider, compare it to statistics with America. You know, if you kind of try to find, make a correlation, what was the closest thing that happened here with that? So this was, he was a governor. You can say he was like a mayor of a city, right? The first African-American invited to dine at the White House was Booker T. Washington in 1901. That's, you know, a hundred and something years ago. And this is not talking about being a governor or a mayor. This is just someone who's invited to step inside the White House just to, you know, be present with the politicians. So look at when America was able to accomplish some of these things. The first one, who, the first African-American who was a presidential candidate in the United States was the Reverend Clennon King in 1960. There are some people who were alive at that time in this audience. 1960, that's in our lifetime. In our lifetime, it was the first time an African-American was able even to run for the presidency of the United States. And we know the first African-American mayor of any U.S. city was in 1966. Again, in the lifetime of many of us. And the first, you could say the closest to this would be, you can say the mayor of Washington, D.C., because Mecca is no ordinary city. So when was the first African mayor elected of Washington, D.C.? Walter Washington in 1975. This is in my lifetime. So you can imagine, look at what we were able to accomplish 1,400 years ago and what the world is struggling with today and we know the history of, of Islamophobia now. You know, the first president who's African-American, Barack Obama. But look at the aftermath. And look how the country wasn't ready for an African-American president. You can see that in all the debates and the rise of all these movements, the Tea Party and, and, and all these new candidates coming out. America was not ready. And still, we as a world, as a nation, and we're not ready to deal with this evil, this specter of racism. So, but the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we have a, they have, you know, he, he, he solved it in a problem that was very practical. And it was actually done in history. These aren't just teachings, but they were teachings that manifested on the stage. So this is something, going back to the quote of Malcolm, you know, America needs to learn Islam, understand Islam, because this is the one religion that erased from his society the race problem. And this is not to say that we don't have problems, but this is the golden period what the Prophet Sallallahu accomplished and what the Sahaba accomplished is remarkable and it's something that all human beings can learn from and it's something that we need to share with the rest of our brothers and sisters around the world. I think I'll end with that. We have seven lessons, but we have about seven minutes, so I think it's a good time to take uh, questions and answers um, rather than continuing, inshallah. So if you have any questions, um, you know, we can open the floor now, inshallah. Yes. I can. Um, Assalamu alaikum, so you can manage. Assalamu alaikum. Fred McDouglas was the first invited to the White House. Okay. Well, who was the name? Fred McDouglas. Okay. Do you know the he, he was he was a, he was a spokesman for Abraham Lincoln during the slave debate. Okay, great. So um, I need to update the, the slides. for no, I'm sorry. Fed. No, I'm Jay. That's I just wanted to correct that. That's all. Barakallahu feek. Alhamdulillah. Yes. Well, if it was Abraham Lincoln, it was much earlier, right? Yes. Assalamu alaikum. Without going into too much detail, would you be able just to uh, mention what the last three uh, texts would have been that you were going to use? Okay. So, yeah, um, so one of the texts is, uh, you know, Iblis being the first racist. So, uh, the interesting story of how Iblis and Adam, when they 
sent to live in this earth. So what was the problem with Iblis? Why didn't he bow down to Adam? Because of his physical makeup. He said, I am better than he, uh, because I'm created out of fire and he's created out of clay. So it was his physical makeup. So racism fundamentally goes back to this basic problem of Iblis. That's one of the texts. Another text is where the Prophet wasallam said, Allah does not look at your external bodies, ila uh, suwarikum. Uh, well, but he, rather he looks at your hearts and your deeds, your inner actions. So, and then there's the farewell pilgrimage. I didn't share that because I'm talking about that tomorrow, but in the last Hajj that the Prophet made, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he gave some explicit teachings about racism. One of them he said, no Arab is better than a non-Arab, nor is a black better than a white, or a white better than a black. So these are some of the texts that uh, are coming up. Barakallahu. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, as you mentioned, that was the you know, golden age and the ideal age of how we should act. And in today's world, outside of the non-Muslims and how they act, how much better are we? And I'm not saying you know, even to look at the Arab world or the subcontinent, but right here in America, right here in New Jersey, our own misogyny organizations, this racism is rampant. So how do we take what you just said and you know, be active on it, implement it immediately? Yeah, that's a very good observation. <clears throat> and I mentioned at least twice uh, that this is what Islam was able to accomplish, but we still have a lot, long way to go as Muslims as well. You know, Muslims are imperfect people. Uh, unfortunately, the last 200 years with the, in the aftermath of colonialism, there was a fundamental shift and disconnect between the Muslims and their tradition and their teachings. And we're witnessing a revival now. We need to go back to the Quran and Sunnah. A lot of the things we see in Muslim communities are the result of culture and the way we were brought up and the nations that we come from. So for a Muslim, and that's kind of why I mentioned one of the texts that the Prophet ﷺ, he was a reformist. He reformed his people and he was struggling with issues from the day he was sent as a prophet to the last days of his life. And that was a reminder to us that we're all going to struggle with these issues. So we're going to have problems in our communities and we do have problems in our communities. Racism is something that affects the Muslim world in a tremendous way today. And it's just ironic that this is our religion, our heritage, our tradition. But when you look at the Middle East, you look at Asian countries, we are, you know, we have a problem of racism. Um, but that's not because of Islam, it's in spite of Islam. And the solution would be to keep teaching people to be patient, to remind them of the Quran and the Sunnah, and to, you know, all the elements of tradition that run counter to Quran and Sunnah are jahiliyyah. And that's what the Prophet used to do. Everything from the culture of his time that was contradictory to the spirit of the Quran and Sunnah is Jahiliyyah. And that's why he said, Inna Allah qad adhab ankum ubiyat al Jahiliyyah. Allah removed this blemish from you. Leave it in the past. So that's what we need to remind each other. Leave these things in the past that we inherit from our culture and our traditions and our societies that aren't in conformity with the Quran and Sunnah. And it's going to be a long struggle. It's not easy. But at the same time, we, should, we can still be proud of our book our messenger, our khulafa, and our tradition, what he was able to accomplish uh, in the golden age at least. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Um, I just have a question. Um, mm -hmm. Is there any supplementary reading or anyone that you would suggest that could, uh, we could further you know, look into besides Quran and Sunnah? You know, I know that's being the best, but I'm just something that's a little bit more uh, tangible that you could maybe suggest, inshallah. Well, um, I, I began with uh, Malcolm X, quote from Malcolm X, and I think for every Muslim working in the United States and around the world, one of the required readings is the autobiography of Malcolm X. I know most people from my generation have read that. We grew up, we were inspired by that, that brought us to Islam, or at least made that emotional connection with Islam. But we're witnessing a generation today that's out of touch. So the new generation today, unfortunately, we live in a time, and it's a huge issue, we don't read anymore. The youth today, they don't read anymore. Everything's on their devices, all the videos, and you know, we just, you know, they, we, we're, we're raising a generation that's out of touch with the past. So on the issue of racism, required reading is the autobiography of Malcolm X. 
That's something anyone involved in Dawah has to read to understand the history of who we are as a people in America and how it affects us today. And it's very relevant. It's amazing how relevant that information and those quotes still are today. Um, beyond that, I don't know if there are any modern books written on the issue of racism from an Islamic perspective. I'm not aware of anything written in a substantial way, but Allahu Alam, there might be. Allahu Alam. We have 35 seconds and counting. Okay, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Sallallahu ala khairu khalqi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.